Welcome everybody, good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome to TPA Global's last webinar for the year 2016. Our topic of today will be the business tax proposals as we know them by today. Um, with the surprise election victory of Donald Trump and the Republicans keeping their majority in both the House and the Senate, tax reform is becoming more likely in the US. Um, the Republicans in the House already had a proposal out, but nobody was really paying too much of attention. Uh, the same was true for Trump's campaign and their views on the Internal Revenue Code. The world has changed upon us. Today we are joined by TPA Global's US partner, Kevin Kiernan. Kevin is a seasoned US tax expert and has been following the latest developments in the US uh, very closely. And the purpose of today's webinar is to give you a flavor of the current thinking of the president-elect and the Republicans in the House and what that potentially means or in which potential areas uh, it might be creating an impact and thus to give you some food for thought. A word of caution, uh, by no means this information should be considered as final. Also we have to interpret some of the positions taken and for sure a lot will change as the discussions on these proposals take up speed into the next year. As these proposals will evolve, TPA Global will strive to provide you on a regular basis uh, updates through other webinars like this one so to keep you abreast and, and, and keep you informed. With this, I would like to give the floor to Kevin. And uh, Victor, please uh, switch to the next slide. Thank you very much, Kevin. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, thanks, Raymond. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, webinar. Uh, as, as Raymond has indicated, you know, the purpose here is, is really to provide, at this, at this juncture, a high-level uh, overview of where things stand following, you know, following the recent U.S. elections, uh, what some of the key elements of business tax reform proposals are that are contained in these, uh, in the in the proposals that we'll talk to in the slides, and to begin thinking about what companies can be looking at in terms of uh, planning uh, of work that may be needed in 2017 uh, relative to some of these proposals. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll take you through uh, where things stand. Uh, on the, uh, in terms of the, the proposals, the House Republican uh, blueprint was released in June of 2016. Uh, the way, Ways and Means Chairman uh, Brady uh, working with uh, Chairman Ryan have produced probably the most detailed set of uh, plans for comprehensive uh, tax reform. Uh, many of their uh, elements or, or some of the elements in the Republican plan come from earlier tax reform proposals that had been released in prior years. Um, we, we do see some elements of the prior Ways and Means Chairman Camp proposal surviving in the House blueprint. Uh, and then, you know, President-elect Trump throughout the campaign has put forth uh, various proposals. They've gone through some refinements uh, during his campaign as he brought in uh, economists and, you know, later in the campaign utilized uh, some of the committee members of the House and their staffs to help revise some of his proposals, and we'll, we'll talk to those as well. Uh, on the Senate side, the Senate Republicans have probably been, uh, you know, the one body here that have not produced much in the way of detailed plans that they've released. Um, you know, one element that the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, you know, Chairman Hatch, talked about earlier in 2016 was his views in trying to implement uh, corporate integration as part of, you know, comprehensive U.S. tax reform. And so uh, 
you know, that, that, that remains to be seen uh, as the Senate releases their plans in 2017. Uh, next slide. So, you know, as, as Raymond indicated, the, uh, the recent elections were somewhat of a surprise uh, in the U.S. Um, we, we now have uh, a Trump administration, a Republican administration coming in in 2017, along with the Republicans maintaining control of Congress. Um, I think uh, many had thought that we would be facing a, a scenario of split you know, a, a bipartisan um, scenario with a uh, Democratic administration and uh, a Republican Congress and, and perhaps a, uh, you know, a, a Democrat Senate at, at one point. Um, but now this kind of lines up uh, the likelihood of reform being able to move uh, as, we, as we move into 2017. The, um, you know, the, 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 the House proposals for comprehensive reform are probably some of the most fundamental uh, in, in you know, the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, certainly 1986 was the last major uh, tax reform in the U.S. So many of these proposals are you know, significant reform elements. And then one aspect here is that the transition rules will be very important as we move forward. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the, the Trump and, and the House Republicans would like to move quickly with legislation as we move into 2000. Excuse me. So that yeah, right, the the Trump, uh, the Trump in the House, yeah, Raymond. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, could could you take this slide? Which slide are we? Uh, on slide three. Yeah. Uh, okay. I just need to. Okay, so basically what, um, what we are expecting is that Trump and the House would like to move quickly. Having said that, there is a whole discussion going on in terms of whether or not in the Senate the, um, uh, the Democrats need to be signing up to these new, uh, the, the new proposals um, to avoid um, you know, the special rules that we know as the uh, budget reconciliations. Um, it is a simple, it requires a simple majority if you would do that, uh, but, um, yeah, and avoiding, uh, you know, the Democratic Party being able to filibuster in the Senate, which is, for some of you, maybe not a known phenomenon, but it is effectively where people can speak for, 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 for hours and days to frustrate the whole process of uh, voting and discussing changes. Um, on the other side, if you would go for the, 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 the simple, simple uh, model of uh, getting it through the Senate, the provisions will have a certain life, and they will have a life of 10 years max, and which means that they have to be voted upon again uh, after that period, which makes the law not a permanent uh, legislation, if you will, but it will then have to be voted upon again in that period uh, which has uh, a life of maximum 10 years. Can we go to slide number four, please? Yeah, so just, just to touch on that, you know, so again, the, you know, while, while the House and the Trump administration have indicated that they'd like to move significant reform in the, you know, in, uh, you know, early in 2017, uh, the, Senate's have, the Senate has taken a more you know, measured approach. Uh, they indicated, at least in some of the public remarks recently, that they'd like to see, uh, you know, or at least give a, a bipartisan effort a chance. Um, I think what remains to be seen, Raymond, here is there are other 
uh, policy objectives of the of the new administration. We've got um, you know the healthcare you know repeal and replace potential uh, that that they are talking about, and they may split that into two packages. They may look to repeal uh, healthcare and replace at some later point in 2017. There's the infrastructure spending bill that the Republicans are talking about. So part of this will bear on the political capital uh, that they need to you know, bring in order to get democratic support uh, for, you know, for you know, comprehensive tax reform. So when we look at uh, both the House Republican blueprint and the Trump plan, uh, the question is, are th these are comprehensive plans that cover uh, individual tax taxation in the U.S., estate and generation skipping transfer taxes in the U.S., uh, business taxes in general, as well as business taxes uh, for companies with international operations. Uh, most of our, as we've indicated, most of our discussion today is going to focus on the business tax changes and the business changes with international operations. Uh, next slide. So if we look at the House blueprint, uh, the, the main elements of the House blueprint are a lowering of the corporate tax rate uh, from, the, from the maximum rate today of 35% to a flat rate of 20%. Uh, it also calls for businesses to be able to fully and immediately expense the cost of investments in both tangible property, you know, equipment and buildings, as well as intangible assets, uh, such as intellectual property. Uh, it calls for uh, a disallowance of interest deductions. The, the House plan uh, does allow uh, for a netting of interest expense within the U.S. group against interest income. Uh, it, it does provide carry-forward rules where such excess interest expense could be indefinitely carried forward and absorbed against future uh, interest income. Uh, they, they've also indicated in the proposals that they may require, you know, that, that it's most likely that special rules will be required for financial services companies. Uh, in the area of NOLs, uh, the uh, changes would uh, uh, restrict uh, carrybacks and no, no longer would uh, corporate carrybacks be allowed. Carry forwards would be indefinite, uh, but there would also be an annual limitation on the utilization of NOL carry forwards of a 90% annual, annual limit against taxable income. Uh, to pay for these uh, reductions, uh, there'd be significant reductions in special interest deductions that exist today in the tax code. Uh, you know, Section 199, domestic production activities deduction would go away, uh, although there is an indication here that the R&D credit would, would remain. Uh, next slide. Uh, on the international side, the House blueprint would shift the U.S from a worldwide to a territorial system, and we know that's been talked about uh, you know, for, for, for many years now as different tax reform proposals have, uh, have been presented. Uh, this plan would provide a 100% exemption for active business income, uh, effectively repealing uh, the current subpart F provisions on, on active business income that exist you know, today uh, under the House plan. The subpart F regime for passive income, or the foreign-based company, uh, for, excuse me, the foreign personal holding company income rules, uh, would remain. Uh, another significant pay for in the uh, business proposals is the one-time tax on accumulated foreign earnings, and the House blueprint, you know, essentially follows the prior. Uh, Ways and Means Chairman Camp's proposals, which called for a, uh, a two-element approach of taxing the accumulated earnings, the uh, element of earnings that were represented by cash or cash equivalents on the balance sheet would be taxed at an 8.75% rate, which is a, you know, a higher rate. 
and the earnings that were represented uh, in all other uh, assets on your balance sheet would be at 3.5%. Uh, the tax would be paid over uh, an eight year period. And the last significant element and a very controversial element of the um, House Blueprint International provisions is this uh, concept of shifting the U.S. from a, you know, from a, uh, you know, corporate tax system to a destination or consumption-based system for taxing business income, with border adjustments applying to imports and exports. The aim of the, you know, consumption-based tax approach is to number one, you know, spur U.S. manufacturing. That's been a big uh, campaign theme of. Uh, you know, of Trump, but also the you know the Republicans are looking for ways to spur uh, you know job growth in the U.S. So spurring U.S. manufacturing is a, a key element of that, as well as the perceived imbalance that has existed between the U.S. and many of our trade partners that operate VAT system. So the uh, destination or consumption-based uh, approach would be to try to to balance that. Next slide. We look at the uh, Trump uh, tax reform proposals, not, not as spe specific or detailed as the House blueprint. Uh, he's calling for a corporate tax rate reduction from the 35 to a flat rate of 15%. Uh, his proposal with respect to expensing applies to manufacturing companies only, not to, not to all companies. And his would uh, provide for an elective regime where you either could could expense capital investments or, or manufacturers could expense capital investments or deduct interest paid. Um, and his proposals likewise would eliminate a lot of special interest deductions that, that currently exist in the code. Again, the domestic production activities deduction would go away. And he's also uh, indicated a, a willingness to retain the R&D credit. Next slide. Uh, on the international side, uh, Trump appears to support shifting the U.S. to a, a territorial system. Uh, not as clear on how his would work, whether it would be a 100% exemption system or whether there'd be some provisions on uh, you know, you know, passive income or, 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 or mobile income. Uh, he would also have a one-time tax on accumulated foreign earnings. His tax rate is slightly higher at 10 percent and that would be over a 10-year period. And Trump uh, has not uh, taken a position or at least his, his proposals that he's put forward uh, have not um, he hasn't indicated where he stands on this tax uh, you know, system with uh, border adjustments. Uh, we do know during the campaign he's, uh, he's talked about U.S. manufacturers moving jobs offshore, or moving you know, jobs and manufacturing activities offshore, and then re-importing goods into the U.S. and his willingness to impose uh, tax costs on, on companies that do that. Next slide. So, you know, there are certainly some significant elements uh, or, or common themes that are emerging between the House blueprint and the Trump proposal. And I think what that bodes well for is the process of, you know, the Republicans in the House, Senate, and the administration uh, coming to a, uh, you, know, you know, reconciling whatever differences they may have it helps when they're all starting with a lot of common themes across uh, the business proposals in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. So here, you know, key elements are the significant reduction in the corporate tax rate, uh, the ability to deduct, deduct capital expenses immediately, uh, disallowance of interest deductions, and the pay for, you know, the, the you know the one-time tax on accumulated foreign earnings that exists in in uh, in both proposals. Next slide. Uh, so, one thing that we wanted to talk a little bit about is the, you know, this House Blueprint proposal 
calling for a shift of the U.S. from a really, you know, from a corporate income tax to a consumption-based tax system uh, is a is a really a fundamental change to the way the U.S. has taxed businesses. Um, this proposal uh, didn't get a lot of attention or wasn't receiving a lot of attention from the time that the blueprint was released in June through really the election, although that's really picked up in recent weeks now that people are focused on the on the fact that with the uh, Trump administration coming in, the, the prospects for reform are much higher, uh, and uh, we need to begin thinking about how this particular proposal would impact you know, businesses. Uh, Import-dependent businesses are rallying at the moment. There's a lot of, you know, they're, they're, they've indicated their strong opposition to this proposal. Um, this proposal you know, does represent a key revenue raising component of the House blueprint. Um, estimates are that the revenue that would be generated from this proposal alone are in excess of a trillion. So that, that's a very key component of how to pay for the reduc you know, the rate reduction and the uh, incentives on expensing. Uh, if this doesn't go through, then you know the the, the issue will be what what size of tax cuts survive, and other compromises that would need to be made in order to make the plan um, you know closer to revenue neutral over the over this over this period, and and whether it could garner you know Democrat support. The other elements of this change. Uh, that are need to be considered would be whether it would be WTO compliant, uh, you know, whether this would truly be considered a shift from a direct tax system that we currently have as a corporate income tax to an indirect system, which is one of the requirements uh, currently that that allows um, you know our trading partners to uh, utilize VAT systems, and also you know what implications. Uh, this type of change would have on our U.S. treaty obligations. You know, the, our, our treaty commitments are typically based upon um, income taxes as the, the main element of the, of the treaty provisions. Uh, what happens here if we move to a consumption-based tax? Next slide. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I think there is a hell of a lot of potential change out there and uh, as we said before by no means are any of these proposals finals um, there's a lot of discussion going on momentarily and as you no doubt are aware you know there's a lot of people that will find their way to the hill to start claiming that their case is important and that certain elements of the proposals or elements of what people are thinking of proposing may have to be strengthened or weakened for each and every case there will be a story. Um, what we try to do with the information that we have so far uh, and that was part of the conversations that Kevin and I have had in our discussions to prepare for this uh, for this webinar was to look at what could the potential impact now be on uh, on, a, on an m and &E, be it a US based multinational or be it a foreign read non-US multinational making investments into the US. Um, this slide and the, 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 the two subsequent slides are aimed at looking at some of more topical areas and the question is always do you need as an organization either being again a US based or a non-US based multinational do you now need to start thinking of restructuring do you need to change your way of your how you do your operations, how you run your operations? And with this, I would like to go through a, a couple of these bullet points, uh, and also, you know, entertain a bit of a conversation with Kevin where where necessary. If you look at the first bullet point, will the proposals really impact foreign tax minimization structures? And this is something which is more 
uh, driven by looking at US multinationals going abroad, setting up uh, typically a, uh, a hub in a country where they can effectively ensure that under the current support F rules they get a deferral, read that the you know the income generated outside of the US is not automatically recaptured into the US and taxed. So they, they try to check the box, have exemptions, uh, one country exemptions to ensure that they have active trading uh, income and active trading underlying foreign tax credits available for the future. So there's a lot of structuring going on, a lot of monitoring and maintenance needed in order for these multinationals to effectively be able to keep the foreign income uh, outside of the, uh, the US tax net and applying all the relevant rules on the support F as well as using you know the uh, US GAAP system APB 23 for the experts to have a permanent deferral uh, from an accounting point of view which helps to keep the effective tax rate down. What does that mean if these territorial uh, rules are coming in and replace effectively subpart F and the global uh, tax system that the US has momentarily? Would you as a US multinational still have a drive for foreign tax minimization? Would, would it be really such a big change or would it just help a multinational in the US to have a more simple system to manage? You would still have a company outside of the US which would then effectively be trading as it is doing today. Um, these are questions. Um, Kevin, I'm not sure whether you want to comment on this a bit from your perspective having managed uh, quite a number of years uh, from, a for, from a US multinational headquartered company perspective. W would you see a lot of changes? Would the world be much different for you if you have a territorial system? Um, you, you know, I, yeah, I, I think the uh, you know with the with the territorial system uh, coming into play, certainly it makes, as you've indicated, Raymond, it makes the process of planning, you know, the planning to achieve deferral that that U.S. multinational structures have had to you know deal with. Uh, it, it makes that you know you know, that, that, that exercise would go away uh, under these proposals. Uh, and I think then it becomes, you know, m more of a straight, you know, transfer pricing, you know, the transfer pricing rules, which, you know, e even today with deferral, you still have the whole transfer pricing landscape. And the, you know, the, one of the points here is that with the OECD BEPS um, actions, and there are many, many different actions that all, Kind of are influencing foreign tax minimization structures. You know, certainly, the um, some of the substance rules within the uh, revisions to the intangibles. Um, you know, the hy hybrid sh structure um, rules that are coming in, uh, in in a few years. These are all things that are putting pressures on foreign tax minimization structures. I think with the significant lowering of the U.S. rate, uh, you know, key question will be whether the tax savings from some of these minimization structures uh, begin to be a much smaller number uh, and you have to then compare that versus the operational and substance costs of maintaining some of the structures that, that have been put in place to determine, um, you know, you know, whether the payback or the tax savings payback on some of these structures continue to be, you know, worth the operational cost that companies are, are, are incurring to, you know, to sustain the, you know, the results. So that, that's, okay. you know, that's how I would you know, be looking at more minimization structures. Uh, certainly, you know, certainly we would, you know, a, a key theme, as I've indicated, is the focus on U.S. manufacturing from, uh, from many elements of these proposals uh, and so it'd be, it's going to be interesting to see whether these lower, these lower business tax rates and immediate expensing, you know, how significant a shift in manufacturing do we see uh, 
you know, back to the U.S. and how does that impact existing uh, supply chain structures? Yeah, if you look at your, you know, you were talking about the consumption-based tax system, which is the next bullet point, obviously. Um, yes, it's very controversial, and uh, you indicated there's already a lot of opposition happening on, on, on the importer side. Uh, no doubt there will be more. Um, but would it also help effectively on, on the second bullet point to bring more manufacturing into the U.S.? Would that be a major driver? as well for, for, for this consumption tax in terms of, you know, the idea to, to install such a, such yeah, a system? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the policy objective of, of that provision, uh, as I've indicated, the two key elements is to spur U.S. manufacturing, um, you know, and even, to, you know, and it's even viewed as, a, as an element that would uh, counter inversions. I mean, you know, there's, there's specific legislation that the U.S. has, has you know, put forth in, in recent years to combat, you know, inversions. But clearly, th this border adjustability provision and moving to a consumption-based uh, tax environment for businesses is also seen as a way of, of um, combating in inversions. Um, yeah, and then, you know. I think the last point here relative to this, and, and obviously, you know, this is going to be a key issue to, 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 to monitor and follow as to whether uh, the opposition is, you know, you know, is too great uh, to allow this provision to survive. Uh, but if it did, you know, it, it's clear that it would, it would likely need to be some significant transitional rules that would come in, that, that would that would go along with any shift from a corporate income tax system to a consumption-based system because, um, you know, most structures have been, uh, you know, are well integrated, you know, many years to, to put in place. Uh, I, I, I got to imagine that this is one key provision that would have to have some transitional period associated with it. Okay, fair enough. Can we go to the next slide, please? One of the one of the critical elements of this uh, reform proposal set that we have uh, been discussing around is uh, is, is the way uh, one is looking at uh, interest deductions, and there is a clear indication that interest is no longer tax deductible unless you have interest income to compensate for this. This can have, at least from my perspective, and at the very first blush quite a significant impact on how groups are being financed. I'll just take a very simple example of a foreign, uh, i.e. a non-US based uh, multinational um, investing into the US uh, by way of debt and, uh, and equity as you would typically would expect. If the US is no longer giving a deduction for the interest, but on the other side the foreign jurisdiction that is providing the loan is having a pickup of interest income that gets taxed. You know, there is a clear indication of um, the risk of double taxation. Um, so that is an immediate concern, I would think, of how do you finance? How do you want to finance in the future? Um, I think, Kevin, I'm not sure if you think about this from a U.S. perspective. Um, you know, this goes maybe directly at the heart of the, um, the last uh, bullet point on this page. If you want to plan, or if you should plan from a U.S. perspective, uh, your, your funding structure, how would you look at that, bearing that in mind? I think from my perspective, if I'm a foreign company, that would immediately be my, uh, my biggest concern, and it would trigger my attention to see if I would go fully equity finance, or you know, in a different way, I would be looking maybe at having a hub that has expenses on the interest side. Uh, as well as it has uh, has income, so maybe I can net net still have a, a a position that makes sense if if interest is flowing to third parties. But otherwise, I might have a, an issue on my hands if part of my funding comes also out of equity, which you typically see in today's structures. How, how would you look at this, you know, in the reverse way if you are a U.S. multinational? 
Yeah, I, I think, well, I, a, couple of, a couple of thoughts here. I think one is what, what provision survives, it, you know, does the, does the House provision that allows offsets for interest income, I think that's going to be a key determinant in, 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 the, in the planning arena. Um, if interest income can be used to shelter interest expense, I think that's going to, you know, play a, a significant role in looking at, you know, the potential of, you know, U.S. groups that have, in, you know, that, you know, so obviously some, you know, many groups are going to have interest expense somewhere in their organization to finance their business. Um, and the challenge will be how to maximize deductions for your global interest expense. Uh, part of that will be, you know, trying to move some of that interest expense in, into your non-U.S. group entities, you know, pushing it out outside of the U.S. group. Um, but also looking at um, the possibility of generating some interest income in your U.S. group uh, to shelter, you know, to be able to shelter interest expense there as well, and you know, intergroup financing, you know, could could come into play. Um, shifting of treasury centers, a lot of, you know, a lot of groups have their non-U.S. Um, treasury activities in a in a in a foreign hub somewhere. Uh, you know, there's, and, and a lot of times that requires separate um, substance uh, around managing those treasury operations. You know, you got a substance in the U.S. for your U.S.-based treasury activities, and then non-U.S. Um, does this simplify things and allow perhaps the bringing together of, of treasury activities with, um, you know, in, in tandem with these other changes? When you know, you know, move to a territorial system. Um, in lower tax rates, uh, does that allow you to generate some interest income from Treasury Center activities within the U.S. group to shelter interest expense? I think that's something that you know companies will be thinking about. Um, and, and then you know, on the outside, you know, on pushing out interest expense to non-U.S. group members, um, obviously you're going to have the OECD limitations that will be coming into play that you'll have to navigate. Uh, as well as you know, foreign country thin cap limits. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I think if we look at the, you know, the um, the territorial system not not creating maybe that much havoc, this one could create definitely an area where there is a lot of concern and interest might not find its way into a, an efficient uh, deduction. Uh, even leading potentially to double taxation, especially if you put the overlay of the uh, the OECD's interest limit deduction limitation rules into play, as we see in Action 4, as you indicate already here. So I think this is definitely one of those areas where it's going to be extremely relevant for, for, for any multinational, be it U.S.-based or non-U.S.-based, to rethink its um, its, its capital structure, how does it fund working capital and longer term capital, how does it do investments in, uh, in into these countries, etc. Uh, with this, um, can you move to slide number 13 please, Victor? We're already going towards the end of uh, the slide deck. Um, IP structures and R&D, innovation tax incentives, I think we just learned in the in the, in the presentation that Kevin gave, that there seem to be a lot of uh, incentives still for IP development, IP development cost, uh, R&D incentives, credits, uh, to be available in the U.S. It almost appears, Kevin, that um, the proposals of the uh, Republicans, the House representatives, uh, as well as Trump, they're trying to find a way that uh, they still want to promote that intellectual property find its way into or stays into the US and and these are sort of drivers to, to make it attractive even maybe for non-US multinationals to, to, to start moving intellectual property into the US especially if you think about lower tax rates or rates that are you know lower or close to rates that we can see for instance in Europe or Asia. How, how do you see this? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think the the you know, the business tax rate, wherever that you know, what, however the you know the process plays out, you know, how how low that rate is, it, you know, you know, with the Trump proposal of 15% would be you know very very low, coupled with a uh, 
R&D credit. I, I don't know if we'll, we'll get to that level, uh, but even the you know the house plan at 20% with an R&D credit, um, you know, could could result in a you know a um, a net tax rate on R&D activities in the teens. Uh, so that would certainly be you know lower than a lot of non-U.S. jurisdictions you know currently. Yeah, and I can see you know some some multinationals, as you said before, they may have their intellectual property, uh, which is non-U.S. related uh, intellectual property, meaning uh, intellectual property that will find its way through products or or, or services into uh, any country outside of the U.S. So any rights that are not U.S. rights related currently sit, for instance, in countries like Switzerland and are being uh, monetized from here also under, if I sp specifically think of a, uh, a U.S. multinational, it's also maybe attractive for U.S. multinationals to keep that structure under the you know, new territorial system, uh, but it seems to hinge on you know, truly the tax rate. Is that, is that also your reading? I think I, I heard you say that, but you know, would that mean, for instance, that if the U.S. would go on a 15% uh, allows for a full deduction of all the uh, expenses incurred on R&D uh, in a year immediately, then it becomes quite attractive to maybe move even Swiss-based uh, R&D and IP to the U.S. How, how do you see that? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, I, I think in, in that area, in terms of intergroup movements, I think we'll have to monitor the rules to, to look at you know, whether there's any restrictions on intergroup movements of IP, in particular in the, you know, this immediate expensing of uh, investments in intangible assets, you know, is that going to be a provision that applies primarily to extra, you know, you know, third party acquisitions of IP, or, you know, will, it, will there be any uh, limitations on intergroup movements of, of IP into the U.S. Uh, you know, relative to these expensing rules, um, mm -hmm. and then you know another key element here, obviously, is the um, you know, the, um, the the consumption-based uh, tax proposal with border adjustments. How, how do those border adjustments uh, apply to cross-border royalty flows? I think that's one area. That's not as clear. I mean, you know, there's on the product side, it's clear that the intention is to, you know, impose a or to penalize import, import of goods and, and to tax, to have a tax on the import of goods uh, and to exempt exports. But in the area of uh, royalty flows, it's it's you know, I think some of those details need to be uh, you know, need to be worked on. Uh, you know, a little bit further before we know how they impact um, outbound licensing, inbound licensing. But you know, the at, at a high level is is talk that you know the inbound use of IP is going to have a similar consumption tax you know uh, cost for you know companies that have IP outside the U.S. that are licensing the use of it into the U.S. They're going to you know suffer a cost and on the outbound side, it should be, uh, you know, exempt. You know, you know, you know, the use of U.S.-owned IP being used outside the U.S. on a, on a consumption, from a consumption standpoint, that that wouldn't be uh, something subject to the consumption tax. Okay, that makes uh, a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and then the sorry. last, the last bullet we had here is is more around. You know the challenges that that many uh, you know global structures have in managing the adempt functions and the, and the related substance requirements when they've split up the ownership of their global IP into like a U.S. Uh, you know a, a U.S. component and a non-U.S. component. Um, you know there's this cost and um, you know, duplicative um, activities that, that we often see in structures in order to to support the allocation of profits to the two buckets of you know intellectual property. You know, this might be an opportunity to to um, simplify that 
uh, you know, again, depending upon the, the trade-offs of tax rates, expensing, et cetera, versus the cost of operating, um, you know, multiple or, or duplicative IP um, structures. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I think we're we're getting to the end of our of our webinar presentation deck. Um, if I would summarize what we have heard so far and what we understand in a very on a very high level basis, I, I come to some conclusions here. And and again, they are subject to a lot of changes that we would expect coming through the whole uh, proposal. Uh, process and, and, and influence coming from lobbyists, etc. But summarizing and on a high level, you know, at first blush, we look at the territorial system not making too much of a difference from a pure tax play perspective, although it will create uh, much likely um, a, a, a more simple way of maintenance for, for the group to um, uh, compare to what it has to do now if you think about SuperDef, if you think about the credit mechanism and keeping the credits in an active basket rather than in a passive basket. So the territorial system seems a, a, a good choice. Um, the tax rate reduction um, is, is in combination with the um, uh, territorial system effectively eliminating sort of the remittance penalty um, that companies uh, encounter today being US multinationals that want to remit uh, uh, revenue or retained earnings from abroad into the US. Uh, today those remittances are seen as, you know, are creating a penalty upon remittance because you now have to pay the difference between the US tax rate of say 40% and whatever you had as a rate outside of the US which is typically lower. Uh, so that is eliminated, which drives, obviously, from a U.S. point of view, a, a positive signal uh, in the sense that cash can come back without a penalty in the future. Um, having said that, on the other hand, there is, a, there is also uh, maybe an incentive to move uh, more operations back into the U.S. Manufacturing, if the rate is going down, you know, you can have manufacturing in the U.S. versus other countries where today maybe the driver could be, amongst others, uh, a lower tax rate versus the U.S. It can drive manufacturing back to the U.S. The consumption tax, uh, which is controversial already and is potentially a huge penalty for multinationals having operations and manufacturing facilities outside of the U.S., uh, but also for foreign multinationals who import, uh, or sorry, should say export into the US, uh, creating a penalty. This is going to be a, a huge debate I would expect uh, to see if this is really going to stand up and, 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 and stay. Um, as a fourth point, funding, uh, the way we are funding groups both from a US to foreign or from a foreign to US perspective, the whole funding arrangements needs to be reviewed because that's going to be critical in terms of where can you have deductions, where do you have an interest pickup. Um, so this would definitely require a, a thorough review of your whole financing uh, structure. The same is true uh, for IP. Where do you would where would you have your intellectual property uh, in an ideal world um, with the rates going down potentially in the U.S. having non-U.S. IP today outside of the U.S. might might change, you might want to have it back into the US. So it looks like, you know, all the proposals are there to sort of support uh, the US economy, uh, which is not a surprise, um, but that is what it seems to be uh, aiming at. And from a first look at it, it seems to have a lot of ingredients that could facilitate that. So this means for any company, it, it has to have a look at also its IP and where it is located. Having said that, and that was one of the last bullet points that Kevin just alluded to, if you change, if you want to change, BEPS is out there and BEPS is looking at significant people functions. So whatever you do, whatever you want to do or plan, you should be very, very conscious of the fact that you need to be able to support that with the people functions at that location. 
otherwise it probably has a risk of not being accepted in other countries. With an eye to looking at the clock, I would like to invite you to ask questions. There is an opportunity to ask questions by uh, our chat box. And um, I, I would like to give it a, a minute or so to see if people have, have questions. Um, and then we'll, we'll see if we can answer that. Are there any questions from the participants? Victor and, um, and, and Yusuf, I don't see any, any questions popping up. Do you see questions? I don't see any questions uh, popping up, uh, Raymond. Okay, then unless you have questions, you know, please, please uh, put them in there. We still have a couple of minutes, but, you know, with an eye on the clock, um, I, I would almost want to say I want to close this, uh, this webinar. We hope having to have given you some food for thought, if you will, and having raised your sensitivity to the potential impact these changes in the U.S. tax uh, rules may have on your organization, on your company. As mentioned before, we will keep a close eye on these developments and into the next year we will bring you so-called update seminars or webinars if and when we believe they are meaningful. And it remains for us here at TPA Global uh, to thank you for your participation today and on, on earlier uh, webinars this year. And we would like to wish you and your families a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and hope to see you all again uh, into the new year. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to close this session. Thank you very much and see you next time.